policy advisor um, at the Justice Programs Office for American University. Why don't you come up on the right? Um, we also have with us Congressman David Trone, who is, represents Maryland's 6th District. We welcome you. And um, we also have Christine Ross, who's the President and CEO of the Maryland Chamber of Commerce. Ernest Smith, who's the owner of ES Fitness. And Monique Baptiste, who is the Vice President and Program Officer at Workforce Strategies Global Philanthropy for J.P. Morgan Chase & Company. We welcome you all to the stage, and thank you so much. Good evening, everybody. Thank you for being here with us today. Um, as Amy said, my name is Genevieve Citron Ray, and I'm a senior policy advisor at the Justice Programs Office. And I just want to thank uh, Amy and the Sign Institute and the U.S. Chamber of Commerce Foundation for reaching out and partnering, bringing us in as a partner on this really uh, important topic and for this event this evening. For those of you who may not know, the Justice Programs Office is a center at the School of Public Affairs here at AU. And we work with the justice community to improve our justice policies and practices through translational research, collaboration, and through innovative solutions. Um, I'm, like I said, I'm very excited to be here with four great panelists to discuss second chance hiring and the um, prison to employment pipeline instead of having a, a pipeline that goes back to prison. So just to sort of set the stage a little bit and why we're here today. Over one in three American uh, adults in America have a criminal record, which is over 75 million people. And as Michael said, there are 7.1 million jobs um, vacant today. We know that the unemployment rate for those with a criminal record is about 27%. So you have a lot of job openings, you have job seekers. We know that employment is beneficial in the reentry process. We know that if those who are unable to gain employment and retain employment have a greater likelihood of, rec of recidivating. So how do we close this gap? And that's really what we're gonna sit here today and explore, and I'm really excited to have people from all different parts of our community, from public sector, businesses, nonprofits, and our communities to talk about how we can have cross-discipline and cross-sector partnerships to close this gap. So we're just gonna start right off and go right down the line. Um, I wanna talk about kind of why are you all interested in this issue and what brought you here today? <laughs> all right, we're gonna go with you, Monique. Here we go. <laughs> Jump right in there, huh? Uh, good evening, everyone. Monique Baptiste, uh, VP uh, Global Philanthropy at J.P. Morgan Chase. Um, so I, I'm here actually representing uh, kind of two sides of our house. One being, you know, a large uh, U.S.-based employer. Um, so we um, are consider ourselves a, a second chance employer, um, and then also, uh, you know, representing philanthropy, um, which is a sector that is really heavily invested in kind of advancing this uh, second chance space. Um, and so I'll, I'll first talk as kind of an employer. Um, so one of the things that we found is that we're in a really tough regulatory environment, needless to say. Um, and so, you know, we are in a lot of ways limited to kind of the policy environment in which we, um, which we're navigating. And so that has actually informed uh, a lot of our philanthropy because the reality is, is that despite, I think, there being kind of a prevailing trend to um, have more employers do things like ban the box and create more employment opportunities for individuals with, um, with criminal histories, the regulatory and policy environment has not caught up to that as of yet. And so as a result, it's left employers um, in a lot of ways to be really creative on how we're solving for this issue. I mean, being uh, a major employer in finance, um, there's already um, a considerable amount of candidates who have criminal histories who self-select out of our pool, who just automatically think, well, if I have a criminal background, I'm not gonna be able to get that job, right? I'm not gonna be qualified for that job. Don't even give us a chance to even consider their application. So we're trying to kind of raise the profile of job opportunities in our industry, in the banking industry, that 
people really sh can still go for, right? I mean, the FDIC, um, which regulates our industry, has actually moved some of their policy barriers out of the way to create more opportunity for individuals who are whose hit criminal history has no risk on the role that they're that they're willing to play. And so it's just difficult just to raise the profile to let folks know like there are jobs in banking, in financial services that they're eligible to to take on. And so that kind of leads us to the philanthropy side um, where we really rely heavily on community partners to raise that awareness and then to also support the individuals who want to get to jobs that we offer at JP Morgan Chase. And so we have um, kind of invested really heavily on community-based organizations, legal aid organizations who can support um, individuals through their hiring or through the job search process, help them with kind of getting the, the their legal paperwork and their get through background checks, get all those documents together, and then also support those those candidates with any hiccups that they might experience once they actually do have the job, which I'm sure we'll get into a little bit later in the panel. But it's 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 an environment that um, I think the sentiment of second chance hiring is ahead of the policy, and so we're really working to try to change that environment. Uh, good evening, my name is Sonny Smith, and I'm the owner of ES Fitness. Um, I'm a native Washingtonian, and um, I have a returning citizen. I am a uh, returning citizen myself. I served 18 years in prison, and I've been, uh, I've been, uh, I've been home now for nine years, and I guess the question was asked, why the critical? that I have return to citizens and for the most part um I didn't have a lot of help with my reentry so I just want to be the you know the person that I needed so to speak. Um, and so we're just trying to further further the discussion on what should be done the uh, the wraparound services that you spoke of um, um, I'm active in teaching uh return to citizens entrepreneurship on Tuesday nights in um, Southeast DC. So it's a lot of engagement uh, and it's a responsibility of my own that I've accepted because of my past and my personal experience. Um, and so I just, I'm just glad to be here and to further the conversation. Great, thank you. So the Maryland Chamber of Commerce is interested in this subject for multiple reasons. First of all, it's the right thing to do at its core, it's to help returning citizens who've paid their debt re-enter the workforce and have an opportunity to feed their families and take care of themselves and their lives. The second part of this is that we're, we need the workforce. There are plenty of jobs out there that um, have gone unfilled and we want to find a way to create that direct pipeline. So we're spending time learning more about what kind of training is going on behind the wall so that we can connect businesses to that training. And then the other piece of this is that just the, you all know what's going on in Baltimore. Um, when we look at incarceration rates in the state of Maryland, predominantly from a zip code, Baltimore, and the recidivism rates being so high that there has to be something more we can be doing and for us uh, to normalize this conversation with the business community, it's really, really important. And they're getting, our, our board of directors is getting very engaged in the conversation and they wanna be able to do more. And we just know that society is gonna have an impact on the families, the children, education, public safety, you name it. It's just, it's just gonna improve everything. So that's why it's important to us. Uh, good evening. Uh, my name's David Trone. It's great to be here tonight with other panelists. I appreciate everyone's interest in this subject. Uh, I'm here for a number of different reasons. Uh, first of all, I'm a trustee at American University, and I'm very honored to be there. And uh, it's a great school you have. And I'm delighted to be able to help out whenever I can. Uh, second reason is I actually was arrested uh, three times 30 years ago and went through. Uh, and my wife did the torture of Dan, 
And at the end of the day, I was exonerated, uh, basically because, one, I never did anything, but two, I had the financial resources, the education, and I'm white. Those are big advantages when you deal with the criminal justice system. So we have an unjust, unjust criminal justice system. There's no incidents about it. Uh, that led me in my business career to build a company called Total Wine and More. Uh, my company now is in 26 states. I have 7,000 employees and we do around three and a half billion in sales. So out of that, I took the difficulty, the challenges, the, and turned that into a positive to be able to build a business, but now we gotta give back. So at Total Wine and More, we've hired over 500 returning citizens. And guess what? As the chamber spoke a minute ago, we've got a 14% better retention rate. Folks deserve a second chance. Then from that, we've joined the American Civil Liberties Union over 20 years ago, and we founded, the, uh, through my foundation, the Trone Center for Criminal Justice in New York. And at the Trone Center, we work on all their criminal justice issues, uh, from capital punishment to voters' rights, um, three strikes you're out, et cetera, across the United States. And the last piece, of course, is in Congress. Uh, I'm a very focused congressman. I want three missions. Addiction with opioids, how we're gonna move America from 70,000 deaths, mental health, how we take away that stigma. Of course, it's co-occurring with addiction. And the third piece is criminal justice because that's where so many folks land at the end of the day. Uh, so I'm working right now on what we call a second step act, uh, which I think we can make happen once we have a new administration. And we're also working on a sort of what I call a baby step act, which is some things we can do on the corners, on the edges, before we get a new administration. And the other piece, of course, is you know how we make the first step act actually effective, which hasn't really connected yet. So that's why I'm here. I'm delighted to be here. Thank you. So as you all have just heard, we have a wonderful lineup of panelists. So bear with me as we try to get as much out of them as we can. But um, I love how you talked about, Christine, normalizing this conversation. So often we are afraid of certain things and don't want to talk about the elephant in the room. Um, and so as we talk about new partnerships, cross-sector and cross-discipline partnerships. Can you talk a little bit about how you're engaging in these partnerships, uh, how businesses can kind of be leaders in this space, and specifically what uh, you and Maryland and the Chamber of Commerce there are doing to encourage new partnerships in this space? Sure, so for two sessions, we were trying to get employer protections passed in Maryland and weren't successful, and so I gathered my team together at the end of last session and said, we need to do something different. And so we invited a very diverse collection of folks who were um, trying to figure out whether they wanted to come to a meeting at the Maryland Chamber of Commerce, sort of the Job Opportunities Task Force and the NAACP, people we hadn't necessarily been on the same side of advocacy. And we convinced them that they needed to come because we had an important topic to talk to them about. And so we're now about six months into the Second Chance Task Force work with um, my colleague Ashley Duckman, who's here this evening. And more people keep asking to join the task force. Every time we have a meeting, emails get spread out. We get three or four more additions. And now we have businesses. We have elected officials. We have nonprofits. We have the Department of Labor. We have the correctional system. We've got a whole variety of folks who we are convening to collaborate with who have never been in the room with us. So it's really groundbreaking, um, and it's allowing us to um, create a coalition of people that maybe we'll be able to get this legislation over the line. And in the meantime, can you talk a little bit about what else you're doing um, while you're waiting on legislators to move some things forward? What else can we be doing to start um, promoting second chance hiring? So we um, had a meeting today that um, highlighted all of the assets that the Department of Labor in the state of Maryland has on this topic. And our goal internally at the chamber is to build an employer resource toolkit and then to convene probably twice a year uh, 
conversations and workshops where employers can come and find out how to navigate this, how they can figure out who's coming out that's got a certification from the Maryland Correctional Enterprises, how they can look to other organizations like Second Chance or Humanum or Lighthouse to find folks coming through different certification systems. They're doing everything from peer counselors for the health care system to construction workers, whatever the pathway is. We're trying to make sure that the employers don't have to figure it out, that we just literally deliver them all the answers right there. So, Congressman, I'm going to now ask you to talk a little bit about what that pathway is. As you mentioned, you come here wearing multiple hats. So right now I'm going to talk to you as the co-owner of Total Wine & More. How are you all engaging in Second Chance hiring? Talk us through that process a little bit. Well, first step is, of course, we've got to ban the box. Otherwise, folks are just going to have no chance whatsoever to get a job, just the way it's a hard fact in life. So that's step one. So we've been working through our efforts at the ACLU to get other companies, companies like Walmart, the largest employer in the world, has banned the box. But what we've got to do now is take it one step farther, and that is how do we get companies to actually be there at the gate when folks get released to already connect with prison, the folks that are returning citizens, to have a job waiting for them. Like, you're recruited when you leave school. When I left grad school, I was recruited. And so someone wants you to go work for them. Well, that's what we have to do with our returning citizens. But to do that, of course, they need the skills inside. We strip all the education out of prisons. And I was just with Senator Dick Durbin, who really drove the two key bills, the First Step Act and also the Act in 2010, which put crack cocaine and cocaine on the same level as far as sentencing. And he said to me, he said, the worst vote I've ever taken in my entire life was the Criminal Justice Act that Bill Clinton and we Democrats drove. We drove that. And it was bad policy, and now we've got to turn that policy around. But we've got to get education into the prisons. So we have a bill in now which will get Pell Grants back into the prison. So I'm working with Durbin and the Republicans to figure out how we can do this on a bipartisan nature. But hey, $80 billion is a pretty easy target. We can easily save, save money, change lives, and make a real difference. And business, that's one of my jobs, to help bring business along so they can see the light that we can do it together. So, Ernest, I'm going to turn to you. You mentioned, Congressman just mentioned programming behind bars. You are formerly incarcerated and an entrepreneur, which is very important. So how did you find it navigating kind of reentry upon your release? Did you find that you had any support, any programming while you were in prison that helped you or hurt you or just none at all? And kind of tell us a little bit about that. Well, first of all, it's nice to hear all the things you're doing, like the Pell Grant, because I was in prison when they took the Pell Grant. So I went through that process. And to hear the Second Step Act and Dick Durbin, I've been following the bill, the bipartisan bill they had about. So that's a good thing, because I have a cousin, excuse me, and I got two good friends that are serving life right now for non-criminal offenses, Antoine White and Irv Hicks. Life right now for non-violent offenses, you know, and so we're trying to, we're working on advocating to get them out as well. And I'd like to have a conversation with you about that. Before I go further, I mean, I have to, I'm basically obligated to do these things, you know, for, speak for those who can't speak for themselves. So the question is, why is it critical? I didn't have the uh, access that some of you people are talking about now, um, some of the programs. And so um, what I found was that the rehabilitative step that I did take, they, were, they, um, they weren't acknowledged. You know, so normalizing the conversation, like you said, is the first step. And we need to stop lying to each other. Like, the more that I do business now, I'm finding people to tell me, you know, Ernest, um, I was one step away from being 
in a bad situation, or my brother, or my uncle, or my dad, or somebody they know, somebody they grew up with, um, went through similar situations that I've been through. So um, it's critical because it's a real issue, like you said, seven, what you said, 75 million, is one in three. So you talking about, uh, you talking about a real, like, like you said, a hidden workforce that has to be engaged. Um, they need opportunities, they need to feel empowered, but also not feel marginalized. That's what I feel, and that's what took me to the entrepreneurship. Um, like I said, I had every uh, certification for HVAC, commercial, residential. I had the EPA license, I had uh, electrical mine, plumbing. I had all these things because I wanted to be an HVAC technician. And so I went to the union and I went to all these different places and I mean, I didn't get a look. Went to my didn't get a look and I had capacity, but I didn't get a look. And so the cool thing is that the very thing that kept me alive, I feel it kept me alive in prison and empowered me with fitness, staying in shape. And so to be able to take care of myself now, it's the same thing that actually helped me survive in there is like the coolest thing ever to be able to you know, employ people through that and, you know, to take care of myself and my family is, um, it's been rewarding in that way. Um, so it's critical because a lot of the social issues that people deal with are what prevents them from actually uh, being successful. And just having those skills, that skill set to really work in an environment where it's um, something that's out of their norm, um, that they may have challenges with just interacting because they are different. You know, it's, it's okay to be different, you know, but everybody has something. And so when, when you normalize that conversation, like you said, um, we don't have, we don't sit there and say, well, I, I, you know, I'm this, I'm that. You know, they sit there and say, you know, I understand the situation. And, you know, we start to share personally um, where we've been, uh, our perspectives and some of who we are, we started to say that we're more alike than different. And so just hiring them and being able to share my personal experience has been, um, that's why I think it's critical, because of my personal experience. Um, I think I, I mentioned it earlier before, um, being what I needed, being what I needed, like uh, you need an advisor, a mentor, and you need a funder. You know, I'm not funding anybody, but, <laughs> but I'm trying to advise and I'm trying to be a mentor to individuals and, you know, um, just doing my part. I'm a, I consider myself a community uh, partner for uh, any type of engagement. Like, I know what it's like to want more than what's available to you. And just furthering this conversation, I didn't know that J.P. Morgan was, you know, off uh, people that was um, convicted of criminal uh, offenses, fainted dogs and anything like that. So I think decimating the information and going into these environments, I engage the uh, community in that way. I look for returning citizens because I know that's where the talent is. I know that um, you can make one decision and you can be here, you can make one decision, you can be there. So. Um, that is a particular uh, demographic that I look for opportunities and to help and assist with. So that's why it's critical to me. Can I add a little yeah. bit more? So Genevieve, I was out at the Maryland, Maryland Correctional Enterprises in Jessup a week ago. And when I was in the um, women's uh, framing department, we got to really chat with um, the citizens that were in there doing really beautiful work. Um, they had learned CNC machines, they knew how to cut molding, they knew how to do shipping and logistics, and one of the women in particular that I spoke to was getting out in February, and she's petrified because she does not know how she's going to find a job, and she knows that the job is the way for her to succeed. Now, fortunately for me, and Ashley, I wish I knew Mark's last name, but the gentleman that started Second Chance in Baltimore uh, was there. And I said, hang on a minute. And Second Chance, those are two great organizations for you to go and see. But she was like, do you have the contact information? So anyway, Mark wrote down his information for her. 
and said, just come to me. The day you get out, come to me. You don't have to stay with me forever, but I will be a pathway for you. I will help you transition. I will help you find housing. We'll get you started. And that really struck me that these people are so frightened because they don't know how. They're going to get dropped off on a corner with, I don't know, 25 bucks in their pocket. It's insane that, that we don't provide a pathway. So I just wanted to share that. That's a really great point, um, and you you highlight so many different things. Um, we can ban the box. We can say there's we're increasing access to employment, but it's more than just hey here apply for a job. There's so much more that goes into um, retaining that job, and even you know the education leading up to you to make you qualify. How do I get to work every day? I drive. I have a criminal record potentially, and there, with fines and fees in certain places, my license might be revoked. So how do I now get to work? You have so many other different obstacles um, that really it's about recognizing the whole the whole issue. Um, so Monique, I want to bring you in a little bit because we talked about this this morning. Um, can you tell me a little bit about kind of what J.P. Morgan is doing to provide? Uh, opening access to employment opportunities. Sure. Um, so we have a whole portfolio of um, kind of philanthropy in this space. Um, so for instance, most re recently we did a million dollar um, investment, both covering program as well as kind of capital, like actual physical structures. Um, in Chicago with the um, Ready program uh, by Heartland Alliance, which essentially is a program that meets um, returning citizens at the gate, to your point, uh, Congressman, um, and helps shepherd them through the process of returning to their community. And to be 100% you know, honest, returning to their local economy. Right, um, and because we know they can either contribute to the local economy or not, right? Um, and so um, that's really where we're leaning in. We realize that those community partnerships um, that are in, that are operating in the places that people are returning to are really, really critical, a really critical piece of that puzzle. Um, the program that we invested in in Chicago um, as one example, um, also has a pretty robust mental health services component that continues um, with that individual even after they find the job to help them retain that job and not have um, any other issues. Because the reality is, is that it is stressful to reintegrate into a community that you've been away from for so long. And we know that you have to learn certain practices to um, kind of navigate that that reintegration. And so that's an area that we're very heavily invested in. We have, um, we're fortunate in that uh, as a organization or as a corporation, we're in every major city in the country. Um, and so our philanthropy follows where our footprint is. And so it allows us to do the same type of partnership and investments um, in every major city in the country. And I think what we're, what we're learning from that is, is, is a couple of things. One is on the ban the box side, because you know, a lot of the partners that we invest in also have employer partners, right? They wanna be that last mile bridge for the individual to advocate on their behalf, be kind of that character, um, that character um, testament for individuals to talk about how they turn their lives around or kind of are, are turning over this new leaf. And so what we're realizing is that with those um, organizations that are identifying employers, there is um, something to be said about the employers, um, like for instance, like Total Wine, like you know, your fitness program, employers who are willing to show the leadership and be out there very publicly about the value of hiring, of giving folks second chances, right? The, um, it rem helps remove that stigma and to be honest with you, I mean, there, there are re there's research that's out there that talks about kind of the negative consequences of ban the box, right? Which is that if you have an organization or a company that might be forced based on legislation to ban the box, they may find another way 
to block that individual from employment within their company. There are a lot of tricky things people can do. But the reality is that when you have leadership in business, right, major employers, our leader, Jamie Dimon, has been very public in this space for the last few years. When you have leaders who are willing to step out and say how important it is to stand behind these actions, right, that you're not just banning the box, but you're actually giving people a fair chance, then that really changes the game because it helps remove the stigma and it helps these things stick because otherwise it just becomes new ways to navigate through what can be a really murky process for somebody who's just returning to our community. Can I add on to that? You know, as an employer, we do it and I've done it because it's the right thing to do, period. But a lot of other employers are looking to do the right thing, but they also want to hit a bottom line. So there's a tax credit now, $6,000 in year one for returning citizens. So we have an idea that given that 75% is the recidivism rate five years out, one year out, 60% don't have a job. We got a problem. The system's totally failed, absolutely failed. It's miserable. FOP, the Bureau of Prisons, BOP, don't even track what outcomes. So we've got to get them to track outcomes. So we're working with the Bureau of Prisons now because I have six prisons in my district, one federal, five state. So I go to the prisons. I meet with the unions, meet with the inmates, meet with the warden, and listen about what's working and what's not. Not much is working. There's no question. But you've got to get business more incentivized also. Some want to do the right thing, so we're looking to try and extend that so it's on a declining basis over three years. So that helps motivate business, but then we've got to help people find new places and new faces. That's the old saying. We've all heard it up here, I know. Because if they go back, if folks go back returning citizens to the same neighborhood, we're going to get the same thing happen again often. So we've got to have that job when they get out. Job leads to two things, the roof and the transportation. With those three things, people have a fighting chance for success. But again, the wraparound's the key. Medically assisted treatment, MAT. We've got to get MAT back into prisons because addiction is following them to prisons. When they come back out, like my nephew died of fentanyl. He was arrested five times during that. So I dealt with those, dealt with his arrests. And when you come back out of being clean and you take the same amount of heroin, guess what? Your body's not ready. And that's when it's laced with fentanyl. We have the ODs. Then we have 49,000 deaths last year on fentanyl alone. So there's a lot of medical work that has to be done with addiction in the prisons and, of course, as you mentioned, many mental health services. And so I work with the head of NIH now, Joshua Gordon, on what NIH sees we need to do because folks are living now with more anxiety, more depression, more trauma that they've had to go through. And then we expect them to be okay. Well, that's not going to work. We've got to step up. It's our obligation. And you mentioned, both of you talked about the importance of leadership. And you both are strong leaders and wanting to do the right thing, wanting to push this forward. Can you talk a little bit about if you had internal resistance at all from other people in your company before you implemented this new policy and sort of how can you overcome that and encourage people to be more open-minded and more, you know, to normalize this conversation and really just look at people as people and kind of move it forward? I was sure it was easy. I told her to go in. I mean, I will honestly co-sign that. Jamie Dimon sat on Fox Business and said, this is what we do and this is what we're doing. And so it was. So, I mean, leadership really changes the game. And the reality is that you'll have – so I'm masking myself as a corporate type. My background is actually in community development. And so I actually ran one of the largest workforce development organizations in northern New Jersey that actually also had a reentry program as well. And so I'm masking. But, I mean, the reality is that, you know, to have a leader who says in very, very public places that gets retweeted a lot, 
um it gives it there's a reverberating effect to that. and so for my job was then easy, which was, ok, monique, go forth and you know make sure that everybody has what they need to continue to move this agenda forward um and remove any barriers that that might be in the way. and so leadership really plays a huge part in this. and obviously both companies are doing very well. so as a business leader, you know maybe don't be so afraid of any backlash. your employees and customers will will stick with you um and won't abandon ship. so i think that's really good thing to remember. i mean it's also worth noting, right, going back to your original one in three statistic the reality is is that there is the population is that's impacted by the criminal justice system is so large in the united states for us to say for us for there to be a perpetual stigma on this population our society and our economy could not sustain that, right? so there is this is no longer kind of a moral imperative. this is an economic imperative. We have over-criminalized our societies in particular communities. We have created a lot of regulatory and policy hurdles that, to your point about the, the 94 Pell ban, that have to walk back if our society is going to continue to move forward. And so I think there is probably more consensus in the business community, which I think is why so many folks will show up to like a chamber all call, right? That, there's more consensus in our communities and in kind of the, the private sector. Now it's just kind of the fear of how do we do this. And so now we have to kind of get really tactical. What are the practices that we are implementing and how, what are the spaces that are being convened where now business to business we can now share insights from those practices. Uh, Ernest, I want to bring you back into this conversation. Um, you were a job seeker, an employee, now you're an employer. Um, you chose the path of entrepreneurship. Uh, can, you, can you walk us through sort of how you came about that path, how you came to start your own gym? Um, you know, you've mentioned that there were things that you didn't have the supports that you needed, you didn't have the opportunities, and so to some extent it was, an, it was a natural path. Um, but can you talk us through that a little bit more concretely so that we in this room can figure out, okay, when we, when we want to make change, what can we do to support um, returning citizens? Well, for me, it was uh, just being in a space where uh, I didn't have a lot of opportunities, but I wanted, to, I wanted to feel empowered. I wanted to do something that I was proud of on my own terms because I know how I felt looking for jobs. Um, I felt marginalized, I felt, um, you know, I, I think I felt bad when I was being turned down a lot of times. And I knew I could do more, I knew I was more than capable, I knew I was more than capable. And so, um, once I uh, committed myself to uh, what it is that I was going to do, um, it was just staying with it, really. It was just staying with it. Uh, one of the things that uh, I think that would help if you take an interest in um, a person's whole life as opposed to just this skill set. Because some of the things that actually um, really um, hinder a lot of uh, individuals when they come from prison is, um, and I know this from just being a business owner, when you learn about bills and stuff like that, you can't really focus. Um, you can't really focus on what's, I mean, the next task. Um, you think about um, uh, Maslow's heart and, mm -hmm. and you say that those basic things, if those things aren't met, um, if you learn about where you're going to live, food, like just things that we don't even worry about. And I know guys who worry about these things. You know, um, having to take a stay in the halfway house or public law because you don't have nowhere to go. You're in the halfway house, but now you can't. When your time's up, you can't go nowhere because you have nowhere to go. So now you have to stay in there under public law. And those are issues that when you're talking about uh, your betterment, you learn about where I'm asleep, 
you know, you, those things right there, that as a grown man, you probably shouldn't be worrying about, what you shouldn't be worrying about. And so um, all of those things contribute to um, some of the recidivism, a lot of the recidivism, because um, if we could take these dollars that we have for this program and then really um, find um, community partners and vendors that, does, that, that, that do the work, that go into the community, that do the work, and we'll have way more impact. What happens is nobody cares about this demographic, to be honest. And so what happens is you have people take advantage of it. They, um, um, the vendors that actually get the opportunities to come into these communities to serve them, they don't serve them. They give them uh, very, um, very basic, uh, just, they, they just cover the agenda that what they're supposed to do, so to speak. And if that at all. And so, um, and the people in these communities don't know their standing. So when you don't know what your standing is, you don't know if these are your tax dollars that they should be serving you, then you wind up just either not participating or getting bad, uh, really bad service. So, um, the, huh? <laughs> no, it's not, it's not, but uh, when you have a community that nobody cares about, then, you know, there's no accountability, nobody's gonna check them, so to speak. You're gonna have them, you're gonna have that, you know, there's no oversight. So you need community partners, you need to go into these communities, like you said, normalize the conversation and find out who's doing the real work in these communities and, and don't look at them as always uh, an entitlement. Look for real partners, because there's real talent in these communities. There's real talent in prison. You know, I like to say that I was talented, you know. Um, but it's real um, talent there. Uh, Look for partners because if you do the same things over and over again and you keep giving the opportunity to the same people over and over again, how do you change anything? How do a person like myself or somebody in a similar situation get the opportunity if you know nobody actually uh, provides them one? And so that's my job. Um, like I said, I've been trying to uh, engage different government agencies uh, for a while now, and I haven't gotten any help. But I know there's still my responsibility because I am one of the ones that nobody cares about to come out of these uh, situations. And so um, if I can hire one, two, or three individuals, and then I, I do my part. Um, if I teach or I train, whatever I can do to really service these individuals because I know that some of them are going to do some great things. We have some individuals doing some great things. That's how I got here. I wasn't um, initially um, scheduled to speak. Uh, one of my mentees, he's, he's a superstar. He's doing so many good good things that he um, passed my name on to speak here today. And um, it says that I had a great talent in prison. I mean, like, and there's, there's issues without a doubt, but everybody has issues. And so if we normalize the conversation and start being real with each other, you will see individuals that start to say, you know what? You know, this guy's all right, let's give him a shot. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much for sharing your story. and Being real and open, um, I think, you know, you've hit it on the head. We need to bring new partners into this space. We need to look to the community, see who in the community is doing this work, who wants to be doing this work, and figure out how we can have some cross cross discipline, uh, cross sector partnerships. Um, so thank you for that. Um, I'm going to give everybody a warning. We're going to have one final question down here, and then the audience. We're going to turn to you. So start thinking of some questions, please. Um, so rapid fire down the line. What? Just final thoughts. What are some key practical takeaways for people in the audience? You know, we have academics, we've got students, policymakers, business owners, community members. What can we do to um, to push the ball forward even more? What are some specific some specific things that can that we can do when we leave this room so that this conversation doesn't just stay here? Congressman, how do we start with you? So we think for the audience to do. You got to volunteer when you have an opportunity. I mean, if you're not going to, you know, you guys are in college, you're working on getting the, the next job and moving forward. But 
you're going to advocate and stand up for those that don't have a voice i mean that's really the key that you know i didn't need a job when i ran for congress i ran for congress i'm just ticked off that nobody stands for those that are voiceless and that's those in the addiction community and that's those in the criminal justice community and i think you know in your way in your job and in your life how you carry yourself you know stand for those that are voiceless uh because that's not what's it's not happening it's the right thing to do and you'll feel better at night you'll sleep better and uh make a difference in your own way with your own company advocate be an advocate for doing the right thing you know giving people second chances that's that's how we should live our life so what i would just add to that is there are a lot of opportunities to provide mentorship to people who are going to be transitioning we just spent uh, a lot of time talking about this today with the Department of Labor, the state of Maryland, and people need that. They're, they're frightened. You think about what it felt like for you. I don't know how many of you are graduate students or, or maybe postgraduate, but just finding an apartment and scraping together enough money for first and last rent and figuring out how are you going to get to and from on a, a public transportation system. Think about what that means to someone who's been incarcerated for 5, 10, 15, 20 years, right? Think about what wasn't invented 20 years ago. And, and, and get in there and dig in and then help elect people like the congressmen who are willing to put themselves on the line to do the right thing. So you got to be involved politically. You have no choice. I know that's why you're here at the school. So I'm counting on you, and um, you can take Ashley's card after this because we could use some more helpers across the line in Maryland. Um, and then um, for us to keep talking about it with our employers, and so the congressman's right, talk about this topic with your employers so they start thinking about it too. Takeaways. Uh, I believe the first uh, takeaways is takeaways you can take. Start where you at. All of you is one in three uh, individuals been incarcerated or had some contact with in the, uh, in the uh, BOP or the Federal Bureau of Prisons. Um, so if that's one in three, that means that all of those that are, that have been incarcerated, they have sisters, mothers, and so it affects more than just the one. You know, across the board, it affects the entire country. Um, so you know someone that, or you're familiar with, I mean, you're familiar with someone that comes from this uh, situation. So you can start dead. Start where you at. Start where you at. You know somebody that needs some help, that been through something, that somebody that went to school with you or whatever. You can start right there. I think that's the biggest thing um, uh, that, that um, we could take away from here today, that you can start where you at. And like you sure said, you could be the change. Be the change that you want to see and just stop where you at. Um, so I, I got my master's in public policy, so I feel like I found my people here. Um, and so I would say, um, to, to your point, dig in. Like, read the laws. Read the bills that are being proposed. And I don't mean just the federal ones. There are things happening locally in the community that you live in that are game changing or that are pushing things backwards. Perfect example, we've got a ton of legislatures across the country who are right now talking about um, uh, expungement, particularly like marijuana, um, you know, marijuana exp automatic expungement, right? How is that law being implemented, right? So you have some states and some legislatures that have paired that um, expungement law with um, actual automation, right? So that when someone gets this conviction on their record and now they're eligible for expungement, it's an automatic process. There are a ton of jurisdictions where that's not an automatic process. So even though an individual might be eligible for expungement, they have to one, know it, right? Two, know how to address it. And three, have the resources to go through that process. 
and think about that as an individual who doesn't have money for the attorney, doesn't have money for the advocate, and even those who might have those resources, it still takes a year-long, if not more, process to get some of these issues, which they're entitled to, addressed and remediated in order for them just to be eligible to apply for certain roles. And so I would say read the laws. I mean, I think, I don't think I've ever been on a panel where I ever thought to cite Kim Kardashian, but read the laws, read the laws and find the stories that bring those laws and the challenges of those laws to life. We can find these stories. There are people with real experiences that are dealing with this every day, even at the smallest, the tiniest level, that if you can connect the issues with our legal system and with our laws and policies to the face of a person and then stand and put force behind them, social media, whatever you can do, you'd be surprised how incredibly impactful there is. Because we have an environment where a lot of our legislatures, a lot of our city councilors, a lot of our ombudsmen and governors and representatives are really interested in this, but they just don't know what's the thing that needs to be changed. Stand behind that, learn the laws, read the laws, find the stories, and start that advocacy. Thank you. So now I'm going to open it up to audience questions. If you have questions, please raise your hand. We have a mic floating around right here. I think my voice is actually louder than mine, potentially. Yeah. Does that work for, I know we're live streaming, does that work? Okay, great. Good evening. Thank you all for being here tonight. My name is Elliot Bell Krasner. I'm a graduate of the School of Public Affairs with my master's degree in public policy. I'm also a current member of the AU Alumni Board, and I work for the Junior State of America Foundation, which does high school leadership development. My question is in two parts, which are primarily aimed at Ms. Ross and the congressman, but all of you guys can certainly feel free to answer. For Ms. Ross, I suppose my question to you, you mentioned something. You really hit on how hard it is for people like us to be able to find a job in a competitive job market and how hard it is, imagine just how hard it is for somebody that's been in prison for 15, 20 years and technology being so different. And so what I'm wondering is where would you advise those touch points can be for those of us who are familiar with the technology and how hard it is to be able to essentially volunteer in that respect? In other words, what are some of the little things that we can do if we know people who have been incarcerated with respect to that? And Congressman, for you, you talk about obviously total wine and other trade skills and what have you. And I'm just wondering about in terms of the sectors that are oftentimes just shut out entirely for former inmates, the State Department, various other government agencies, nonprofits, organizations that work with children. There are people, I imagine, that have a lot of passion for this, but because of their criminal record, even if they were wrongly convicted, they don't have those opportunities. So how do we knock down those type of barriers where those type of barriers exist? Thank you for that question. So we just heard today from the Maryland Correctional Enterprises, the system through the Department of Labor, and they were talking about how they have 89, it's not an iPad, but whatever the generic form of an iPad is, not connected to the Internet, in the entire incarceration system in Maryland. And they're excited about it because they are getting technology into the hands of people for the very first time. But think about that. 89 devices across the whole state. Now, this is groundbreaking for them. They are not allowed to be on the Internet. They cannot have telephones. There's a whole host of reasons why access to technology could be really challenging. So they're having to balance getting those pieces of equipment into the hands of students who are now 
learning for their ged is much more effectively and being able to prepare for and pass tests. so that's i don't know how you're going to necessarily help with the technology piece, but what i can tell you in maryland, for instance, you could volunteer for lighthouse lighthouse is a program that provides housing for homeless they provide drug treatment and rehab and there's a beautiful restaurant in downtown chic annapolis called the lighthouse bistro where every single individual in that restaurant, which i frequent friday nights, my husband likes to go down and pick up dinner and bring it home and act like he cooks it's all right i'm the beneficiary of that but they're teaching them how to run that business, all the culinary capabilities and they're providing the wrap around services humanum in baltimore is another great place second chance in baltimore, another great place. i mean there are thousands of groups that are doing good work but ask around. j p. morgan chase probably has some ideas and if you can get to the point where you're mentoring someone who hasn't had anybody who's a high functioning adult in their life ever just that could make the world a difference first of all there are as i mentioned earlier a lot of jobs are just simply off limits for certain citizens it's over a thousand we've identified in the fifty states when you break it all apart so again being active in your politically is helpful i like you folks that are trying to be forward looking i mean we need to try and knock those out because i mean why should you be able to be a beautician well some places you cannot hold a cosmetology license if you're a returning citizen seems like that's probably okay but we got to change those things but the other piece of it is you know we got to really work on that education i keep going back to education and investment on the folks that are in prison i used to talk to the secretary of education dick riley he's a friend of mine he always talked about pay it forward and if we pay it forward and put that money the average education level in prison is about sixth grade i mean those folks aren't going to the state department i mean we got to connect with business that has jobs that tie in with skills that we can help create and then once they're out maybe it's ups fedex distro centers lots of different places can work with a less highly educated workforce but it's good with their hands entrepreneurial as the dickens as you've seen that here but once the folks get out, then they work, then they'll climb the ladder. They'll catch up on the, those technology skills that, you know, I was with a gentleman at uh, Vehicles for Change up in Baltimore the other day. You guys know Vehicles for Change? And they do great work. I mean, the, the guy said, hey, I've been in for 18 years. I committed murder. You know, I've never held a job in my entire life. And it's, he needed a lot of soft skills on top of just the hard skills for him to get a job because... So I'm sure you can talk about when you go to an employer after you're out, when someone tells you how to do something that's constructive, sometimes folks take it the wrong way because they're used to a guard inmate mentality, a tell type authority position. And sometimes that's not received well. And so we need to also develop soft skills for folks that are incarcerated before they can be released so they're ready for a new world and have a chance to, to win. Yeah, I think we have time for one more question. Yeah, but but oh. also, just to piggyback on what you just said, um, normalizing that conversation is important because not only do these individuals need to be trained in the soft skills, these employers or the managers that haven't been incarcerated need to know how to talk to individuals as well. That's, I think that's the most important thing. You know, um, they feel... Um, they, they sh they're going to shame an uh, individual because of his past. So, I mean, to me, that's more um, the issue than the reverse. You know, yeah, from the point. Yeah, and, and my experience. That's my experience. Totally. Time for one more question. Yes, come over there. Great. I hope you guys can hear me. I lost my voice. Um, recovering from a cold. Um, first of all, my name is Sheila Kasasa. Thank you, Sean. It's amazing to see you. Actually, I was at your house earlier this year when you were running um, for Congress, so it's great to see you on the other side. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I'm the CEO of a company called Future First. We're essentially a coding boot camp for opportunity to use returning citizen. 
know, we got a chance to pilot out here in DC for the last three years, raised about 300K in the last three years, which is super awesome. And um, we want to start challenging um, cities, companies to start realizing that it's not always about like just general skills. Um, I mean, we're able to teach returning citizens how to code and give them tech jobs. And so um, for a company like myself, what are resources for us to have a seat at the table? We've been super successful in DC. We expanded to Prince George's County. And I'm originally from Montgomery County, so I'm trying to inch my way back home. But I'm noticing a lot of resistance in just getting back home, right? So there are not a lot of funding opportunities. Um, we're, we have a nonprofit arm and a for-profit arm. But we have the nonprofit, I mean the for-profit arm, because we also want to start challenging this concept of returning citizens, opportunity youth are not nonprofit, right? We're not, it's not a charity. So how do you also create sustainable opportunities like contracting partnerships with like JP Morgan and those initiatives, um, here at Chamber of Commerce, um, different kinds of partnerships to actually be a training facility like us and then start actually connecting this population to tech jobs, tech, tech careers that are gonna be sustainable. So my recommendation would be to connect with the Department of Labor and your workforce development boards in those two local counties. Um, good luck with Montgomery County, they're very special there. <laughs> I'm not running for office, so I can say that. Um, because they need trainers all the time for specialty, and then you hopefully can get the pipeline directly into some of the partners. We also know that large companies in the state of Maryland always want to do um, business with other minority small business owners. So. Um, you, Talk to the folks at the um, Business Development Center. It's all over the state of Maryland and it's free and they can help connect you with those minority partnerships because some of their funding is contingent upon them doing work with smaller um, organizations and so you should be able to get some traction there. And just because you're a nonprofit doesn't mean you're not a business. Um, well, thank you guys all so much. I think this has been a really Great conversation, we could talk for a lot longer, but gotta be mindful of the time. Um, but I think there's some great takeaways from this that we can all work on doing as soon as we leave this room. Volunteer, normalize this conversation, have the conversation, push yourself in uncomfortable settings. Uh, even if you just talk to one new person and open their eyes um, about something, that's a start. Uh, help raise awareness about the importance of providing second chances. Businesses as can be leaders in this space, this cross-sector partnerships, looking to the community for answers and including the community in uh, these processes. We can make policies up in our ivory tower here at the university or in other spaces, um, but really it's the people on the ground, the people that are gonna be implementing the policies and affected by the policies, they can sometimes have the best insight um, and definitely critical insight. So I thank you all so much for coming tonight. I'm so thankful for the Science Institute and the U.S. Chamber of Commerce Foundation for including JPO in this event and for convening such a great event. Thank you to all of the, um, the support staff through the events and logistics to help get this off. Thank Thank you all for battling the rain and the traffic of DC to be uh, here with us tonight. Um, and really, thank all of I thank all of you on the stage um, for letting me uh, be a part of this conversation and for taking the time to share your insight with the rest of us. So I hope everyone will stick around. There's going to be a reception um, in the hallway, I believe now. So um, please, let's keep this conversation going, and please join me in giving the panel. Uh,